You're listening to the Turn Autism Around podcast, episode number 187. I'm your host, Dr. Mary Barbera, and today we are bringing back a podcast that is one of our most downloaded podcasts. We are approaching 1 million downloads in the next few months, so um, it's super exciting. And we just started this classic rebroadcast series of our podcast um, to bring back podcast episodes that we refer to a lot, that are very popular. Um, and we also started doing uh, at the same time, I think this is only our third rebroadcast. We also started doing an update or an FAQ um, podcast episode right after it. So for Dr. Murray, we did Dr. Murray's uh, rebroadcast on medications, for instance, and then we did the five top five questions we get on medications. So today we are doing the classic rebroadcast on social and play skills, which is podcast 187. Next week, tune in because we're doing the top five questions we get about social and play skills on 188. So let's get to this episode that was previously aired uh, a few years ago, actually. So we're bringing it back. It's all about social and play skills. So today's session is all about autism and play skills. And when we think about autism and play skills, we're talking um, about, there's two types of play. There's independent play, and those are your leisure activities. And then there's social play, and that is play involving other people. Today, I'm going to focus mostly on that social play component um, because we do tend to teach these, these things uh, separately, and we want our children to be as social as possible, and we want them to use language, and we want to pair this all up together. So uh, today we are covering mostly that social play component. And it's really hard to separate out play versus social versus language. And many of my free and paid resources all focus heavily on language. Um, because what I have found is um, it's really hard to build adequate social and play skills without the language to support it. And it's easier, and um, it's easier for me to teach parents and professionals how to teach language, and then um, the social and play skills will will be taught in 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 sync with that. Um, okay, so as we all know, uh, autism is characteristically diagnosed with a failure to socially communicate social communication skills, rote repetitive interests are also usually part of the diagnosis. So that play and social piece is largely missing from kids who are diagnosed or showing signs of autism. I am also going to talk about this book that I got. It's published in 1997. I bought it at a conference. I saw the authors present on this book. I think it was 2000. And I bought the book for like 40 bucks. The good news is you can download this book um, for free and my uh, staff will post the link for that in the comments or in the show notes. Um, so, but stay with me here because this link isn't going anywhere. You're going to be able to download this and I'm going to cover the pieces of this book that I would highly recommend. But most of you listening are actually probably have kids or clients that are not ready for this kind of uh, in explicit instruction on play and social skills. So I'm also going to cover some of the prerequisite skills uh, to get us going. So as you know, or just found out, I fell into the autism world in 1999 uh, when my son was diagnosed with autism one day before his third birthday. His name is Lucas. He's now 23 years old. And when Lucas was two years old, um, when he was 21 months, my husband first mentioned the possibility of autism and I shut him down. I told him I never wanted to hear the word again. And 
we had a second baby right away. So when Lucas was 18 months old, we had Spencer. And so um, Lucas was was warm and cuddly with me. He had some language, but at the time I had knew nothing about how to teach language. I had not, I knew nothing about how to teach play skills. Um, and so we thought maybe Lucas would perk up and start really playing with kids better and start talking more if we enrolled him in a, um, toddler preschooler class, which was a two year old preschooler class. Um, in our neighborhood and um, Lucas just turned two in July so the so the class started in September so there were you know newly turned two-year-olds like Lucas and then there were two year th two and a qu two and three quarter year olds almost three years old there were some kids in there that turned three right in October so there was a wide range of abilities and going from a two-year-old to a three-year-old, that is an explosive age in terms of play and language. So um, Lucas had very few words. Like I said, I didn't know how to teach new world words. And I know now he was not diagnosed with autism. And besides my husband mentioned the possibility of autism, he, we, you know, once uh, no one was thinking or talking about autism for Lucas. Um, so he would go to this little toddler class and, you know, he would, wouldn't have a problem separating. Some of the other kids had major separation anxiety. Some of the other kids had major aggression when other kids took their toys. Lucas wouldn't really care if somebody took a toy out of his hand. He would just kind of go to the next toy. Um, he would enjoy the little sing-songy, you know, circle time, but if it got too heavy with language, he, um, was not attentive. He wasn't rolling around on the floor or running out of the classroom, but it became clear mid-year that Lucas was falling behind. And that's when the teacher and the preschool director brought us in, my husband and I, and, um, they basically said Lucas was, uh, they used words like in his own world and he wasn't, uh, really participating much. He did like to paint and he did like to do the instruments with the shaking, with the songs that he was familiar with, but, uh, there was no, um, you know, understanding of a lot of a language and they were worried that, um, it was time for enrollment for the three-year-old class. And they were worried about him moving up there. Um, that, you know, it was a worse, staff to student ratio in the toddler course, you know, they didn't have to be potty trained in the three-year-old course classroom. They did the staff, to, you know, there's only one teacher. So there was no way that teacher could leave to change a diaper or anything. So potty training is one of the barriers. And so Lucas stayed back in two-year-old preschool. And in that, in that, um, year, he was diagnosed right before he turned three. So he repeated the two-year-old preschool and he went with an ABA therapist, right? Uh, who shadowed him. And, you know, a lot of people that I see with little kids with autism or signs of autism, um, some of them don't have a choice. Like they work and they need childcare and the child is in daycare all day. Um, but studies have shown, uh, lots of studies have shown for many decades that kids with autism really need intensive one-on-one -on -one ABA and just having a one-to-one -one person shadow you around um, and prompt you and make sure you don't hit anybody and make sure you don't roll around on the floor. That's not the kind of instruction kids need. Kids need very systematic instruction on language and play skills and imitation and all those sorts of things. So Lucas did get uh, 40 hours a week of ABA, including these two mornings a week where he continued to go to preschool. And for him, that was uh, a good thing um, because he already knew the routine. He was comfortable with the teacher and he had an ABA therapist there who would make sure that he, you know, was fairly focused and didn't make a mess with the paint and didn't um, get into any trouble. And he continued to progress to the three-year-old preschool and the four-year-old preschool, and he went to typically developing preschool. Um, 
some kids with autism that when they're young, they go to special needs preschool, which was an option for Lucas, but we chose to do home ABA and this typical preschool opportunity. But, you know, I had some clients who went um, into special needs preschool and, and what I found was sometimes the one-to-one, you know, environment wasn't good. There was, you know, eight kids and, and two teachers or three or four teachers and aides, but that's still not a one-to-one ratio. And so there was very little pull out time. I had one mom of a boy, I'll call him Adam, and he went to special needs preschool, but he was off every Friday. So mom thought just to expose him into a, a typical daycare on Fridays was was going to be a good thing. But when I started with Adam, I observed him at home and in the special needs preschool. And I went to daycare on a Friday and he was in his own world. The kids around him were, were just... Uh, running around, negotiating play. Um, he was in his own world. And at one point he even, he didn't have a one-to-one when I was there. And even at one point he started licking the wall and I had to, of course, get up and stop that. But, you know, little Adam didn't make any progress for a whole year in this. Um, and he went from age three to age four, making no progress. And so one of the very common mistakes I see both parents and professionals making is, is they think that just exposing kids to other typically developing kids is going to make social and play skills come naturally. And it involves a lot of work and it usually involves a lot of work with teaching language. So, I have done several other video blogs and podcasts. I did podcast number 17 on social skills. Podcast number 18, I had a guest, Ashley Rose, who teaches social skills uh, instruction to older kids, usually. And I also did a couple of video blogs on mistakes people make with social skills and also how to teach both independent and social play skills, which you may want to check out. Um, so in addition to thinking exposure is the answer, exposure to other kids and thinking that social skills will come naturally, um, those are the, the two big, um, mistakes and as well as programming too high for social skills, working on things like manners and turn taking and greetings and sharing and saying, I'm sorry before a child has these prerequisites, which are really baby infant type of um, social and play skills. So let's talk about how typically developing babies, what kind of play and social skills they have. So babies and typically developing toddlers, and I, I am saying this because if you have a two, a three, a 12 year old that doesn't have these baby skills of being social and playing, it's going to be really hard to get to the good stuff in this Playtime Social Time book, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. So babies, uh, eye contact, cooing, smiling at a caregiver's face. Um, when you point, the, the infant or toddler should be following your point. They should start pointing between 12 months and by at the very latest by 18 months. And this isn't just like a point here or there. This is a point a lot. Every day you see pointing in a 12 month old to 18 month old. Um, You have to see pointing, reaching, gesturing. If a baby or a toddler takes your hand and puts it on an item, that's called hand leading. And that's actually a red flag for autism. So lack of pointing, hand leading are red flags um, by 18 months of age. But um, young, typically developing uh, 12 month old, 15 month old, 18 month olds also bring you things to show you, to get your attention. Um, Okay, if you are familiar with the VB map assessment, which I talk about a lot in my verbal behavior bundle courses, uh, the play skills in the zero to 18 month uh, level include putting items in, 
stacking blocks, um, sitting on the floor or at a table um, and attending to, you know, being aware when people walk in the room, being aware when people call their names. I did a video blog on, on response to name, which tends to be another red flag for autism. Um, looking at faces, not just eye contact, but at your face, being aware. So when a uh, typically developing baby, you know, spills milk or whatever, um, they would, you know, say an 18 month old spills milk or spills water. Um, they would look at their parent, look down at the mess, like, oh gosh, what are we going to do kind of thing to negotiate that, um, where a child with autism might just start playing in the water, just more of that cause and effect kind of thing. Also when tested with bubbles, for instance, when you blow bubbles and you put it back in and okay, your turn. Um, a typically developing child would be looking at you like, come on, you know, even if they're not talking, they would be looking at you, reaching, uh, giving you the bubbles, looking at your eyes to see if it was okay, if you were going to do it. Um, where a uh, child with signs of autism will just hand the bubbles back to you, to your hand, and, and kind of require the hand to do all the movement to get the bubbles going again. Okay, so those are kind of those, one of the things that people don't realize is that you really need to have some attention the child needs to be sitting and attending. I am a big fan of bringing very little kids, once they can sit safely, um, out of the high chair, out of a strapped booster seat. If you have to do that for a young child or even a child with physical disabilities um, to keep them in the high chair or in a strapped in chair for safety, that's great, that's fine. But once they can freely walk and run and sit and have balance to sit at a small child size table, I do find that my approach revolves around pairing that table time up to be so much fun. And we are teaching language, we're teaching cooperation, we're teaching sitting skills, attending, um, we're teaching beginning language skills. What I find is that some early intervention professionals, me included, uh, when I was an early intervention professional, um, I would often go in and if the parents didn't have a table or didn't want to use a table, I would spend a lot of my time just chasing the child around the house, trying to, you know, hold up a picture of a cat or a little toy figurine of a cat and saying cat once or looking out the window and trying to get the child's attention, look at the tree. Um, there simply just wasn't enough time of focused attention to really improve language so much. Okay, once you have those beginning language skills, which are covered more in depth uh, in the toddler course, as well as the early learner course, which is part of my verbal behavior bundle of courses, then we get um, to teach or we the child naturally develops uh, skills such as sharing, turn-taking, greetings, pretend play, uh, understanding rules of games, negotiating, um, cooperative play with others, imitating others, playing games like Simon says, then playing board games and, and those sorts of things. Also an advanced uh, social play skill is, is using manners, saying please and thank you. That comes much later. Saying sorry, I see that often. I did a video blog on saying sorry where, um, you know, a child with very little language, little to no language hits someone and then they're, they're being explained to why hitting is bad and say, I'm sorry. They have, you know, hardly any words and now they're, um, being prompted to say, I'm sorry. They just don't understand the whole thing. So we not only have to look at delays in expressive language, but also what, what they're comprehending, their receptive language. Um, and some families have no choice. They, their kids are in daycare all day long, or they are in preschool or at a caregiver's house all day long. And, um, but if you really do want to catch the child up and, and get them to their fullest potential, um, they're going to need a 
most likely some serious one-to-one -one instruction. Most research shows that kids with a diagnosis of autism need at least 25 hours per week of intensive one-to-one -one ABA instruction. And that's a lot of time. That's, you know, Lucas had 40 hours a week. And I don't see, my approach trains the parents first and foremost and always keeps them in the captain's seat. And then uh, they know how, they know how much therapy. It's basically, we want to engage the child for all of their waking hours, as many of their waking hours as possible. Their waking hours is something like 100 hours per week. And even for older kids, we want to keep them as engaged as possible. Um, we are in the middle, uh, at the time where I'm recording this, in the middle of the COVID shutdown, um, where parents are, you know, really struggling to keep their kids with autism um, especially their older kids engage for long periods of time. Um, there's a lot of free access to screen time and, the, and that is leading to lots of stimming, lots of, uh, regression in some cases, which is, is so tough for parents. So, um, to get to those higher skills of using manners and being flexible and, and, uh, using language in the natural environment. Um, we have to make sure we have those prerequisite skills, the ability to sit and learn the, the, the wanting to be with you. We don't, we can't teach kids how to be social and play if they're trying to get away from us, trying to get back to their iPad. And so we, we have to do it very systematically, make table time super fun, make it so reinforcing that the child is literally running to the table. I used to have clients where they would, I would show up and they would go to the table and, and drag, try to drag the table out. That's how excited they were to see me and to get to the materials, which we go over, um, in my courses. But now let's get to this playtime, social time book. As I said, in the beginning of the session, this playtime social time book was written in 1997. I paid about $40 for it. I saw the authors present at a conference and what it does is it lays out the importance of teaching play skills and starting on page, um, 90, 92. Um, we start with 20 different activities in this playbook, such as a bean table, and it lists all the materials you would need, like a bean table or two or three large tubs or bowls of beans, large spoons, different colors, cups, funnels, toy cars and trucks, small baskets, and other toys and containers. And then it goes down the list, and you could... Uh, prompt sharing such as Tommy hand Susie the big scoop or the blue funnel or those sorts of things. As you can see, these are pretty advanced language abilities. So we need to know what big and small are. We need to know colors, which surprisingly gets taught much later than most kids get exposed to colors if they're not picking it up on their own. Um, the next activity is a birthday party where we would gather table, chairs, plates, spoons, Play-Doh that you can use to make pretend cakes, um, teapot or pitcher, uh, 10 pegs for use of candles, or you can use real candles. So what I have recommended to both teachers, these are preschool teachers or uh, autism support classroom teachers, is to make a couple of these boxes so you have the materials all together so i would have in this birthday party box i might have the script on top and it's really important too that you don't use the script broadly every time the same and it's not to say that if they if the child doesn't know big and small you would just omit that that uh, you know, these are just ideas one of the problems with kids with autism they get very rude so I would have a bean table box, uh, and then I would have a birthday party box of, of the materials already gathered. 
And that way we can kind of uh, go through some natural environment teaching, whether that's at the table or on the floor, um, whether that's in a classroom or at home. I just find that this book, starting at page 92, there's 20 activities. And you might even have other activities that you could just page through these and get some ideas. Okay, another great part of the book. So I like two major parts of this book. Um, the Playtime Social Time book, page 136, we have scripts that teach, systematically teach social skills to small groups of children. So I have recommended these social skills groups. They're, they're more, um, they're scripts such as Language for Learning, um, direct instruction scripts. So we would have a small group of children. You could do this if you have multiple siblings at home. Um, or you're in a preschool or an ASD classroom, you could run this. Today we're going to talk about sharing. Sharing is, you know, what are we going to talk about today? And then the class would say sharing. Uh, if you have a child who's not talking, they are not ready for this. You have a child who doesn't understand any, you know, isn't, isn't able to label, to request items. That's really where you want to start back um, and teach them some beginning language before we get into this book. But I do know that there are many children who get up to this book um, or the, the um, play and social skill needs that this book covers. And I find it to be a great resource, especially since it's free. We are going to link that in the uh, right below, uh, wherever you're watching or listening. So in summary, uh, and then play skills, independent play skills, um, also are a whole different thing to teach. And we, maybe we'll do another session on that sometime. But um, these social skill play skills for kids with autism are super important to teach. Hopefully I gave you some good ideas on where to get started and to really look at the language ability of the child and the play and social abilities before we program way too high, before we expect things to come in naturally, and before we expect that just exposure to typically developing kids is going gonna, is gonna to work out well. I have found that if the adult really teaches a child how to play, we can often transfer these skills to playing with other kids, other typically developing kids, or kids with delays or disabilities. Please give a thumbs up, leave a comment, and share it with somebody who might benefit. And for more information about uh, our course and our materials, you can attend a free workshop at marybarbera.com forward slash workshop. And I'll see you right here next week.